Hi, here we are, midweek service in his house, praise God. How do you know it's his house? Because he shows up. Amen, I'm so glad he does that we can call this God's house. He's faithful. Amen. Let's look at 2 Timothy, the first chapter in the sixth verse. Who's got the microphone? Brother Jesse and Brother Nathaniel. Brother Nathaniel, turn to Daniel, the third chapter, in the 19th verse, Daniel 3 and 19. Brother Jesse, turn to 1 Samuel 3. You'll be reading verses 1 through 3. 1 Samuel 3, 1 through 3. Brother Nathaniel, Daniel 3 and 19. Would you stand and read that at this time, brother? Then was Nebuchadnezzar full of fury, and the form of his visage was changed against Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Therefore he spake and commanded that they should heat the furnace one seven times more than it was wont to be heated. Turn up the heat, right? Stir it up. Get it hotter. Brother Jesse, would you read your scriptures? And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. And the word of the Lord was precious in those days. There was no open vision. And it came to pass at that time when Eli was laid down in his place, and his eyes began to wax dim that he could not see. And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, and Samuel was laid down to sleep. The presence of God was in the house, the ark of God. The lamps of God, which were located in the tabernacle, were to burn continually. Let that sink in. They were to burn continually, night and day. This high priest had let his spiritual light dim. And as a result, the lamp of God was going out in the temple. You know what his problem was? His priorities were wrong. I want us to take a moment and think about our priorities. What is our most important priority in our life? Just think about that. Contemplate that as we stand to pray and we read our text. 2 Timothy 1 and 6, Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in thee by the putting on of my hands. It's wonderful to see Brother Fred and Sister Pettingill here tonight, Sister Cheryl and Sister Catherine. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we love and we praise you. We thank you for the privilege to be in your house. We thank you so much for your goodness and your mercy. I pray for an anointing that can come from you only. Anoint this lowly servant, I pray. Set a guard at my lips. Help me to say only the things you would have me to say. Nothing more or less. I pray that you would anoint the ears of this thy people, that they might hear the word of God, having a faith building. A faith increase, allowing these words to go down into their hearts. God has got to get below the shoulders. They've got to have understanding and believe what they read and what they hear. I pray may we not depart this place sorrowfully, but rather joyfully. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Look to your right and say, neighbor, stir it up. Stir it up. Praise God. All right, in the first book of Timothy, the Apostle Paul wrote to Timothy saying he besought him to remain in Ephesus when he went into Macedonia. The young preacher Timothy had traveled with Apostle Paul for many years. I guess you could say he was a sidekick to the Apostle Paul. He understood the ministry of Paul. He shared the burden. He was willing to forsake all and travel with Paul similar to the way the disciples did when it came to Jesus Christ's ministry. The Apostle Paul stated that he intended for the young bishop, the young preacher Timothy, to stay behind in Ephesus after him and Paul had worked among the believers in that local assembly in Ephesus. Now, I'm sure it was earth-shaking for a young minister to hear an aged minister say, you just stay behind while I go on. I thought about if I took Brother Nathaniel and Sister Rachel to Guatemala and we're making plans to return to that country because the last time we went, God just blessed us and helped us. But wouldn't it be awful if Brother Nathaniel heard his daddy say, Brother Nathaniel, you just stay behind. You take care of business. Brother Nathaniel would have to say, Dad, did you really hear from God regarding this? Are you sure? And Brother Nathaniel would say, do you mind if we go out back and pray this through, just kind of get out in the middle of all them coffee bean trees and really 
get a hold of God and make sure this is the will of God. So y'all imagine with me this young preacher, Timothy, what ran through his mind when this man he had been so dependent upon is now telling him, you got to get it for yourself. Because now the responsibility of this local assembly is on your shoulders. I could probably close up the Bible and just dismiss after that thought if you get a hold of it. We can get this for ourselves if we'll stir it up, okay? And so he also told the young preacher, Timothy, he said, make sure there's nobody coming in the midst of these believers that we've worked so hard to get sowing seeds of discord. He also told to make sure they were not teaching any other doctrine. It's apparent that the old saying to be out of sight is to be out of mind in some instances is untrue as in tonight's case before us. We know that Apostle Paul said he remembered the tears of the young preacher Timothy day and night. I mean, Timothy was such a good servant and such a good minister that out of sight was not out of mind. I want to be that kind of person. I know when Sister Cheryl was out sick the last couple services, because she was out of sight, she was not out of mind. I thought about her all throughout the services, between the services, and since then. I'm sure the same thing is for Brother Dwayne. He could say the same thing. My wife was not sitting next to me. Out of sight was not to be out of mind. What about these that have gone on to be with the Lord that we miss? They're not out of mind. And so sometimes the things that we hear in this life among the whirlings is not always true. Y'all remember a sermon I preached recently about you can't believe everything you hear, okay? You'd like to hear that sermon, see Brother Jeremiah. But Apostle Paul is quite fond of Timothy. In fact, he calls him his own son in the faith. And Paul has upon him the weight or the care of all of the churches. And he has trusted this young preacher to take over this particular church. And so I want you to know that it's refreshing for any minister to be able to have a comfort and a consolation in the fact that there are other preachers somewhere doing a work for the Lord. It's an encouragement to me to know we've got other preachers here, there, and throughout. I mean, the United States of America, people of like precious faith that are at their post of duty tonight. We know that when we get to heaven, there'll be a multitude of heavenly hosts, folks, a number that no man can number of people that have been faithful to the Lord. And so I want you to kind of let that sink in. Apostle Paul has said, I'm leaving you right here to do the work that God led me to do. And so he also goes on to tell Timothy that there would be false teachers entering in among the flock, not sparing them. He said they'll worm their way right into the assembly of the believers. Why? They do not leave the people of God alone. I'll never know. It's just like Satan to try to come into God's garden. It's just like Satan to try to creep into God's house. And, and so in 1 Timothy 4 and 14, Paul told Timothy, Neglect not the gift that is in thee, which was given thee by prophecy, with the laying on of the hands of the presbytery. This speaks to me that we need to come to church. That's what James said, if any sick among you, let him call for the elders of the church. Let them pray the prayer of faith over them, right? Anointing them with all. And we know the consequences of obedience of that scripture. The Bible tells us what kind of great things might happen through the prayer of the saints. And so Timothy has received something that is very special to him. Apostle Paul in the first letter is telling Timothy, don't neglect that gift that is inside of you. And remember that night the council of the elders put their hands on you and they prayed. That is the laying on of hands of the presbytery. So I want you to think with me right here a little bit about Brother Philip, my son, I mean, right now he probably feels unable to pastor a church. But I feel like he is more than able and equipped with everything that he needs to be a blessing at the local assembly. He only needs to stir up the gift that we have given him through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. He knows how to worship God. He knows the Pentecostal dynamics. He knows how to lift up holy hands without wrath and doubt. He knows how to clap his hands for victory. He knows how to leap for joy. He knows how to shout unto God with a voice of triumph. But will he stir it up? And so 
I know Paul is telling Timothy there's going to come a time in your life when you're going to cool down and you're going to have to stir it up. I see this cooling down process. It is a spiritual global warming that has taken place in the world today. I mean, in the churches overseas, the same thing is taking place. Nobody is stirring it up. I like to go to the buffet and look before I eat. And a lot of times I realize the only thing they need to do is stir it up and it'll look better. You cooks know what I'm talking about. And I thought about our services. If we would just stir up the gift that is within us, we know it's there. We know what's been put into us. We felt at that moment faith came in our heart. We felt at that more moment that the blood of Jesus washed us clean from all of our sin. We felt that we became a new creature in Christ Jesus. Hey man, I'm feeling the shout out right here. And so Paul went on to tell Timothy that if he took heed unto himself and the doctrine taught by Paul and the Lord Jesus and if he continued in them then he would be able to save himself and those who heard him. So uh, Paul said if you'll practice what you preach buddy, uh, you'll be able to not only save you, your wife and your children, but those that are coming to church and listening to what you're saying, you'll be able to save them. Just don't neglect this gift. The Bible said how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? It also said he that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin. I wonder how many times do we like Eli come into the house of God into the temple of God and everybody knows that the flame is flickering a little bit and all somebody's got to do is turn up the heat a little bit or put the fan to it and fan the flames and so that's what Paul's saying if you don't tend to this fire if you don't fan the flame we're going to lose some things and we're going to lose others that's why Apostle Paul said lest when I preach to others I find myself a castaway. What he's saying is dry, wet wood that will not burn. Apostle Paul wanted Timothy to keep that which had been committed to his trust. Listen, the Pentecostal people of yesteryear expected us to carry the baton on down to the next generation coming behind us. This was the purpose of Samuel and the other younger priests being in the temple was that Samuel Somebody would get stirred up and somebody would tend the flame. We can't find where Samuel got out of bed. Why? Because he had not been properly taught as Timothy had been. But we find Eli and Samuel fast asleep while the flame of the Pentecostal worship or the Pentecostal power is all but diminished. Are you with me here? I can feel you with me right now. And so it's up to us. We've been committed to our trust to see to it that the Bethel Holiness Church within this independent Pentecostal holiness movement is a place where the fire is burning. When I first started preaching, I told somebody I was going to go to Alaska and pioneer a church and name it a place of fire. I mean, they had a lot of cold days and dreary nights. There was a lot of times I'm sure they wanted to feel the warmth of a fire and I said we put underneath the title of that church where the fire always burns. I'd like to do that to some churches today that come up to mind right now. People that seem me are okay with the idea of letting the power of God just dwindle away in our churches. I can think of churches of yesteryear in my background where there was only one or two that tended the oil in the lamp of the house of God when I was only one that seemingly allowed the fire to burn as Jeremiah and David of old who said while I was musing the fire burned and as Jeremiah said it burned within me. Apostle Paul saying you know that strange warning that took place that night as we lay our hands upon you. And I want to move on here tonight not preach too long but there is a second book of Timothy and I think some three or four years later Apostle Paul is still remembering the tears of Timothy as he prayed 
He's remembering the fiery prayer, the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man availeth much. Where are the tears at in church anymore? Where are the blood stained altars? Where are the tear stained altars? I mean, they don't even let the blood of Jesus be spilled out anymore for the sinner. They've taken the altars out of the churches. There is no sacrifice. Where are the blood stained altars? And where are the tear stained altars of this time and this generation? I've heard of them removing those out of the house of God. It's an indictment against the pastors and the deacon boards and the leaders. I don't believe Abraham and David and Paul would agree with the removal of the altar bitches in the house of God. I believe here tonight there ought to be also altars of fire. A place where we come to church and we stack the wood just right and we pray the right prayers and the fire of God rains down out of heaven. Are you going to focus with me here tonight and listen to this message as I preach? God help us to stir it up. I cannot just lay in my bedroom chamber and pretend like it does not need tending to. Like the Boy Scouts on a camping trip. Nobody wants to get up and get out of the sleeping bag and to stir up that fire. Everybody is waiting on somebody else. How about at 30 years of age and down? Will you do what you can to see to it that the next generation's got a fire? I tell you why I come to church. It is what bought my soul about 25 years ago was when I saw people on fire. I'm preaching here to us this night that we got to stir it up. You're not going to stir it up by wasting your time on your cell phones. You're not going to stir it up by having earbuds in your ear listening to this and that. You're not going to stir it up being YouTube addicts. You're going to have to do the same thing that Timothy did. He got to stir I'm almost finished here you see Timothy is now having to pastor a group of believers even though Apostle Paul is riding from the dim light of a Roman prison cell he begins to encourage somebody else to fan the flame I could imagine how maybe his lamp had blown out and how the inspiration for this letter came about as maybe the Holy Ghost spoke and said remember Timothy you know the Bible said a word fitly spoken is like apples of gold in pictures of silver maybe Paul said somehow in his spirit that Timothy needed to be encouraged I know that Sister Cheryl testified to me personally about a week ago and this is to no credit of mine but she said that night that the swamp buggy fell on the way and she said he was in so much pain and I mean it was life threatening brother Nathaniel she said as I took my phone up in my hand to text your pastor to let you know why you're out of town am I telling her right sister Cheryl she said a text came in from you pastor that said how are y'all doing you know I'll never forget that moment when the Holy Ghost spoke to me in Pigeon Forge in the middle of vacation a family get together and the Holy Ghost said somebody is in need what would have happened if I'd have hit the ignore button to the Holy Ghost talking to me but listen God spared Brother Dwayne's life and he's living proof tonight of the power of God able to sustain life and to preserve it if we stir it up I've heard of people going on vacation and decide it's time to let the coals go away. It's time to let the fire go out. I've heard of them vacationing and getting out of the presence of God. I've heard of them going on furloughs. I've heard of priests abandoning ministry for a year. I thought about what happens when that priest abandons his post of duty and he goes for personal renewal and refreshment for a lengthy period of one year. 
here. I tell you what happens. That congregation begins to dwindle to nothing. And the flame begins to flicker. And everybody begins to lose their passion and their zeal and their fervency. Are y'all with me here in this church tonight? At such a time as this, Apostle Paul is using parchment and pen to encourage the young preacher Timothy. It's a dark cell, brother. It's a dark time right now for some of us as we bear on our shoulders a recent happening. But I want to tell you, in the midst of our trial and in the midst of this circumstance, I've got to be able to encourage somebody else. Apostle Paul was such a man who was facing the chop block of Nero, but he was able to minister to somebody else. I wonder, has somebody been on your mind this week? Sister Cheryl, you've been on my mind. Has somebody been on your heart this week? We need to have others in our mind. We need to have others on our hearts. We need to pray without ceasing for one another. You know what happens when we put it out of mind? We lose our burden. We lose our hope. And so we know the Bible said the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous man availeth much. That is not a now I lay me down to sleep. I pray thee, Lord, my soul to keep. If I die before I wake, I pray thee, Lord, my soul to take. That's a good prayer to teach a baby. And to continue on praying with a toddler. But if I hear Brother Rocap praying that prayer before Sunday school Sunday morning, I'm going to go over and nudge him and say, Stir it up, son. Stir it up. I'm talking to somebody under the sound of my voice. Yes, life has its ups and its downs. It's got its good times and its bad times. It's got its slow days and it's got its busy days. But if you don't stir it up every day, your fire will go out. Why would Apostle Paul feel like he needed to encourage Timothy? Because ministers need encouragement too. I've thought about the statistics that I've read over the years and that other preacher brethren have forwarded me and I knew the reason for them forwarding it to me was because they were wondering if they should exit the ministry or if they should give up their burden. I've heard some of them say, God has not obligated me to do this. I'm trying to purchase to myself a good degree and the weight has been too great. But I wonder if things would have been differently if Samuel had got out of bed, so to speak, and had went in there and tend to the flame or tend to the lamp of God. Somebody might say he wasn't eligible for that. Neither was David at the time of shoe bread. I know I'm preaching a little deep. Let it sink in. And sometimes we depend on the preacher or the elder or the pastor's wife or somebody else to come in to the house of God and stir it up. They Samuel, what would have happened if you'd have stirred up the lamp of God? Oh, come on now, Nebuchadnezzar. He told the most mighty men of his his providence. He said, I want you to go in there. Is that not what our brother read? And what he said, make it seven times hotter than it's designed to be heated. The designers don't want it to be heated any hotter, but Nebuchadnezzar is saying, there are some things we need to burn up and there are some things that need to be disintegrated and dissolved. The remedy was, turn up the heat. I'm telling you, Somebody under the sound of my voice. Yes, your issues are great. And yes, they're bigger than you can handle. But all you need to do is turn up the heat. I'm almost finished. The Apostle Paul told Timothy while he was in prison to fight the good fight of faith. I went one time to pray for a dying man. Thirty-eight years old, pastor of a little country church overseas and called a village church. Went over there. I knew good and well the Lord had spoken to me to go by there. Went about three hours one way out of my way. Had to come back three hours, so six hours overall out of my way. 
to walk in there and to pray for a man that was laid up with cancer and dying. He was 38 years old and had a beautiful church family. He had church in his living room, if I remember correctly. And there he lay, ate up with cancer, nothing but skin and bones. I went in there to pray for him and to minister to him and his family and the fellowship and to say our final goodbyes. As I went to leave, he said, would you pray for me, preacher? And I said, I sure will. And he had a little bottle of oil. And he said, when you get done praying with me, I want you to take that bottle of anointing oil with you because I won't need it. And as we prayed, the power of God came down and we thought for sure the Lord would heal him and raise him up. Everybody in the house expected a miracle because of the way God came down. There was no flesh there was nothing at work but the Spirit of God. There was nobody trying to counsel somebody and be in somebody's ear and manipulate anybody. Just two men trying to get a hold of God and say their goodbyes. Not anybody trying to be a know-it-all and be a chief counselor. We took it to God Almighty and we begin to pray. That affects a fervent prayer of the righteous man. In the face of a dying man, he wouldn't have wanted it to be any differently. After we got through praying for about 30 minutes, we had to leave because I had to be at work. The next morning, he looked at me and said, Brother Howell, I want you to continue to preach holiness. And I'm saying goodbye. He looked at me and he's had, I guess you could say, a self-conscious clearing session. He said, I have not fought a perfect fight, but I have fought a good fight. And I said, isn't that all the word of God required? Was that we fight a good fight? I said, you fought a good fight, brother. Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. Are you listening here? I want you to look at our text again. Wherefore I put thee in remembrance that thou stir up the gift of God which is in me by the putting on of my hands. Already one time, Brother Jeremiah, he told him to let not the gift that is in me which was put in me by the laying on the hands of the elders of the council. And now he's saying here in the second book after three or four years that went by, Timothy is meeting encouragement again I'm telling the church I know we need times where we are encouraged but there's got to be something within us that makes us encourage ourselves our preacher can preach under the anointing of the Holy Ghost the power of God can shake him and can quake him but you've got to stir it up yourself Christian boys, holiness boys, Pentecostal young men, listen to me. You can't be fantasizing over Delilah. Some of you can't find the wife of your dreams and of the will of God because when you go to town, you think you can convert that carnal girl. It doesn't work. For over a week now, God's been speaking to me about that. You better wait patiently. And you better quit lusting after Delilah. That's right. I'm not talking about lusting to be in the bedroom with her. I'm talking about that's what you want uh -huh. because it pleases you well. It's what makes your heart beat harder. It's what makes your pulse race faster. Oh, right. I mean, you're looking for love in all the wrong places. Oh, come on now, I'm telling you. You're not going to find a good thing among dirty things. And the same thing with you girls. You've got to have your heart fixed on Jesus. And you've got to be tending to that fire. You've got to be passionate towards Jesus Christ. You've got to remember this. Without Jesus, you'll have nothing. And without putting Jesus first, you'll never have anything. You know what you're not doing? You're not remembering the faithful of the land. I thought about this. How can we get somebody uh, to get out of their comfort zone and their place uh, of rest and get about uh, stirring up the gift uh, like Samuel and Eli should have done? Uh, I mean, the mighty men of Nebuchadnezzar did stir it up. Uh, and they tried to get the job done. Uh, and what it is, you're not going to that prayer closet uh, and you're not stirring it up. Uh, I mean, you've got to pray till you pray through uh, 
until God says yes or no. You've got to remember the faithful. Brother Jesse said it. Pastor prayed one in for me and Brother Nathaniel. He'll pray one in for you if you can wait. Remember the faithful. When I think of Sister Clara Stanley and that little old rural community, that little old church of God out in the middle of seemingly nowhere, technically in the middle, just across the street from Cracktown, where prostitutes walked outside, where prostitutes solicited me and others. Just across the street from the church of God after service, prostitutes solicited the young men. But Sister Stanley didn't let that dim her view of the old rugged cross or dim her view of having a Pentecostal service. I mean, them harlots and them drug dealers that rode up and down them streets in the limousines and that were selling drugs to our friends, they would have been competition and successful if it hadn't been for Sister Stanley's fire. Oh, come on now, preaching a little deeper maybe than you can comprehend and get a hold of. But could it be one or two or three people's ears? Amen, fire that is keeping you from losing your soul to a spiritual iceberg and a spiritual avalanche of coldness. You better warm up your heart and thank God for the fire that is alive and well at the Bethel Holiness Church. You've got to remember the faithful. Timothy, you've got to remember Paul. You've got to remember. Amen. Come on. How many of you are looking back to somebody right now in your background of history that you remember came to church with the fire? There's been times I've relied totally on Christ's faithfulness. How he handled trials, circumstances, temptations, and tribulations. I think about Hebrews chapter number 11. I think about those heroes of the faith and how they endured such severe persecution and physical bodily harm and how they trust God and they had that faith that is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, and they obtained a good report of people that fanned the flame of faith, and they refused to let the fire flicker and go out. Are y'all with me? I mean, what is it going to take for you to remember to pray in the morning? What about the recent events? Did you get out of bed that morning and talk to God before the day I'm talking about? Did you get on your knees and pray? Did you get in the spirit? Did you feel a burden? I'm telling you, we ain't going to survive the spiritual holocaust and the spiritual global warming if we're not being like Paul for Timothy. Pray! It's okay, you have to take your yes, yes, yes. We're relying on somebody else's fire. Apostle Paul was a fire builder. The Bible said after being shipwrecked, the first thing he had to do was build a fire. Some of us would suffer a little spiritual temptation, tribulation, turbulence, testing and trial, and we decide to just throw all the wood out. Apostle Paul gathered the wood. Remembering the faithful. What did they do in times of coolness? They didn't just become lethargic. They didn't become apathetic, right? I mean, they became concerned and realized what we need right now is a fire. During these times of testing and temptation and turbulence and trials like we're going through, brother, we can't go in there to the oven and turn the fire down. We're going to have to turn it up. I mean, now is the time to pray for one another more than ever. Now's the time to worship more than ever. Now's the time to come early and pray that nobody gets disheartened or discouraged because of what they're going through. And I know we can only help them so much, but then our text comes into play. You've got to stir it up for yourself. You stir it up. I've talked about those that stirred it up and about those that found the flame, but I'm saying we got to stir it up. Somebody ought to bring some wood and somebody ought to bring some fire and stir it up, Isaac. You know you carry the wood. You know Abraham is 
think of. But what are we going to do about a fire? Amen. God is faithful and we will have a fire. See, we can't just pull off the shelf 15 minutes with a sermon like this because it pulls us all in and it makes us feel personally responsible for what's happening. In other words, there's nobody allowed to just sit on the stump and stick your feet and your toes near the fire while Sister Wooten pours on the wood. We've all got to remember the faithful. That's how you fan the flames. Point number one, remembering the faithful. I can make it through this trial. I'll get through this battle. I can climb this mountain. I can stand this test. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And again, I want to correct those people that always say their Hebrew names are this. Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. That's correct. That's true. But who knows more than the Holy Ghost? I read it today again in my Bible. The Holy Ghost moved the holy men of old while they wrote the scripture. And the Holy Ghost had them write Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. That ought to be shouting there right there. The Holy Ghost could have wrote the Hebrew names. What this is telling me, even in the midst of difficult circumstance, while the world is calling you every name they want to, you can still get in the fire. I'm telling somebody, if you get in the fire, you'll survive. Why this happened to me? I don't know. Oh, I the Holy Ghost. Why this happened to them? I don't know. Let's just raise our hands and worship and praise the Lord. Remembering the faithful. Samuel faithfully ministered to Eli. And this is what caused him to be so anointed. The verse after our text tells us that God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. After Paul told Timothy, stir it up. He said, don't get fearful. Don't worry about the devil. Don't worry about them turning up the heat. Just go ahead and worship God. Let's raise our hands and worship and praise him. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and love. And a sound mind, my second point is, remove fear. Remove the ashes. Remove the coldness. Remove the darkness. We're remembering the faithful, but now we're removing the fear. I don't care, Brother Nathaniel about the recent events that it took place. Sister Rachel, I am seeing they met other little Rachels and other little Nathaniels that will join Brother Chapter over there in God's timing. We're going to remove the ashes of the past and plant in the flames of today. There's somebody in our company tonight that is so busy worrying and threatening about your failures that you don't fan the flame. Oh, I'm going to shout in this house. Put out fear. Because fear has torn it. The ashes remind us of what used to be. What used to be. What used to be. But I tell you what used to be already is. If God will do it again, brother Philip. Sister Pettigill said God will do it again. I believe God's going to do it again. We're going to throw fear out. Is that not what the three Hebrew children said? They said, oh king, don't have a panic attack. And you might be raging with fury right now, but we're not careful. Our blood pressure ain't even elevated. We're not careful to answer you in this matter. Our God who we serve continually. They're killing the flame continually. Daniel's praying morning and night. Three times a day, he's praying. I tell you in this service, we need to worship God again. His praise shall be continually in my mind. I will praise him in the good times. I will praise him in the bad times. Come on, Nebuchadnezzar tried to stir up fear, but these men of God stood up in faith.
Remembering the faithful. Removing the fear. The devil tries to stir up the fear. But they stood up in faith. Brother and sister, when faith comes in, fear goes out. Stand up. Shout unto God with a voice of triumph. My soul hope thou in God. It's the only thing that could help Abraham when he bought the cave of Machpelia. He bought that ground to bury Sarah. And there were the other patriarchs said, and there I buried Rachel. There were places of memorial for what used to be. But brother, we gotta walk on. We gotta go on. We gotta travel on. We got to minister faithfully like Samuel did so that there will be an open vision so that the power of God will speak in our church so that the power of God will draw a sinner to an altar of repentance. We've got to be a testimony to this world that despite the circumstances, our God is greater. Yeah. Woo. I see that holy haze as I'm preaching. It's a challenge to all of us right now. We're feeling it. I can't stir it up for you. I've stirred it up for myself in this message. You see, Nebuchadnezzar's trying to stir up fear. And that's what I felt like God told me. The devil's trying to stir up fear in the hearts of somebody. You better stand up in faith. When faith comes in, fear goes out. I've talked to Brother Jeremiah before. Brother Jeremiah, how hot does it have to get to cremate a body? 1,600 degrees. That's how hot they heat up and retorts the crematories there at his place of business. And I did a little study this afternoon at 111 degrees Fahrenheit. An object reacts to that temperature. At 180 degrees Fahrenheit, it causes a first degree burn. At 131 degrees Fahrenheit, a second degree burn. At 140 degrees Fahrenheit, the pain receptors have been overloaded and the body goes numb. I personally witnessed somebody's pain receptors going off and shutting the body down. I remember when Brother Platt was suffering for two or three weeks and he'd come to me pouring sweat. He made sure nobody else knew about it. Nobody knew. And I'd say, are you all right, Papa? That's what I called him. He said, no, I'm not all right. I hurt so bad. And then he would fix his jaw and walk to his car and sit down. And his wife and his family had an idea that he was in pain, but nobody really knew the intensity because that's just the way some men are. And he was cut to, out of that mold. Then I got that phone call that Brother Platt's unconscious, right? And they can't get him to come to. And they're trying to figure out why he won't come to. And a specialist walked by and said, why don't y'all check his gallbladder? He looked like a dead man. He said, I think the gallbladder has done that. They brought the sonographer in. The sonographer did an ultrasound on the gallbladder. And they said this thing has been dead for a good while. The blood supply is cut off. And this gallbladder is rattling in the body, the abdomen of this elder gentleman. That specialist peeked his head back in and said, I told you, I've seen this before. This man's body has shut down because of the pain receptors. Are you with me? And that's what fear will do. It's got torment and it will trigger immersions and it'll have an adverse effect on you and it'll take your praise out. It'll take your worship out and your faithfulness. You'll come to church and you'll see nothing but ashes. But I'm telling somebody it could be tonight becomes the time that you fan the flame. You cannot afford to go numb among your pain. You've got to stay sensitive to the Spirit of God. You've got to stay in tune to the need that the lamp of God must burn on. Humanity shuts down at 140 degrees Fahrenheit. He said, man, I feel bad for them people that burn up in the car a couple of weeks ago. I did too. Until I studied that, I realized, brother, they didn't feel much after a while. But when it comes to the human soul, if we allow it, pain will take its toll. And it will make us numb to the things of God. 
already? Have you hurt? Have you been suffering already? Maybe a young person, a young adult, somebody the earth has been hard on you. Life itself has been hard. Your peers, the pressure of people on the job, and already you've got numb. You come to the house of God, you see the flame flicker. You know God spoke to somebody and said, go pray with that person. You know God spoke to somebody and said, worship me and obey God. But we're so numb. The Bible spoke of those that would be past feeling. I feel the preacher, I could preach two or three hours tonight. I'll try not to do that. But listen, you've got to throw up your hands. You've got to start banning them flames. You've got to stir it up. I know you've been burned. Some of you've been burned a lot worse than others. Some of you feel like your child's severe and you've only got first degree burns. Other people like Sister Cyril's right at the point of, of I mean, the pain receptors being overloaded uh, and going numb, but she ain't shut down. Hallelujah. I, I said she ain't shut down. I, and I also read today that 162 degree Fahrenheit uh, is the temperature uh, when human flesh begins to dissolve uh, or to burn up. You would know that, brother. Uh, as soon as you slide that frozen corpse in there at 16, 1800 degrees, uh, it consumes, right? Uh, listen, you better let God Almighty be a consuming fire in your life. It's got to consume that lethargy and that apathy. It's got to consume. The flame has flickered in your life and I felt it. I'm talking to more than two or three of you here tonight. What about me as a pastor? How many elders have we buried in the last six or seven years? Listen, that means the flame has flickered, but I refuse to sit there uh, and cry in the ass piles uh, of yesteryear uh, of what used to be uh, and I'm expecting somebody to be a Samuel. Are you feeling this tonight? If you're not, can it be that already there's a spiritual blizzard coming in your life? You remember when it didn't take much for you to shout? It didn't take much for you to say amen, praise God, glory to God. The preacher is only allowed to turn it up so hot. The Holy Ghost is the only one that can turn it up hot enough. And I want you to know you've got to do your part. And so, Brother Jeremiah said bodies are cremated between 1600 and 1800 degrees. It was last year, Sister How and I got on a little trip. And I went and watched glass blowers at work. And some of them furnaces reached about 2400 degrees to melt that glass. And brother, the handiwork was beautiful. And so we're saying that Nebuchadnezzar's fire could have been seven times 162 degrees. I don't know. Don't you think they probably used that furnace before? And they had designed it to destroy and to burn up refuse and garbage. But can I tell you, no matter how how hot uh, the devil turns it up. Uh, God's children are not garbage. Uh, you are not garbage. Uh, you are the child of God. Uh, and God is wanting to help you. We look at the furnace as though it's an incinerator. I look at it and see it as an opportunity for prayer meeting. We look at it as this fiery trial it's a strange thing. How much New Testament time do you want? We look at it as it's a strange thing, this fiery trial. But the thing, how do you defeat fiery trials? With a shield of faith. You deflect the fiery darts of the wicked. How can the people of fire who serve a God of fire fear a devil throwing fire? How can people who serve the dragon slayer fear the great, great dragon? How can people fear him that lives in the region of the dam among the lakes of fire? Fear the God that prepared the fire. How can you fear that? You fear the God that can destroy both soul and body in hell. But we don't fear these trials, these temptations, these circumstances. We have faith that our God is able to deliver us. 
Nebuchadnezzar told them men turn up the heat. But when Paul told Timothy stir up the flame, how long has it been since somebody in this church house turned up the heat? You're already waiting on Sister Howell or one of these elders to stir it up. He's saying, Timothy, rekindle it yourself. I can't be there to stir it up. You're going through ministerial hardship. You've got to stir it up. What do y'all think happened to him when he realized there's a man in a cold prison telling me to turn up the heat? I ain't got the freedom, but I'm going to tell Timothy he's got the freedom to turn up the heat, physical heat. You know why Apostle Paul was telling the young man Timothy that? Because historians and in Hebrews I found today, Timothy was in prison himself. Now, what an example, elders. It is for every time you get in and worship and praise God like you're doing tonight. Every time you obey God, Timothy starts recollecting about how Paul loved to remember things. And he starts remembering about Brother Leon Buzzard singing. How many times did Brother Leon Buzzard, that Cherokee Indian, sing? The flame has flickered, but the fire has never gone out. I used to love to hear Brother Leon Buzzer preach, but I waited for him to sing that song. There wasn't hardly a service go by that Brother Buzzer didn't sing it. Then it came to the time where diabetes took its toll on his body, and he lost one leg, and he kept on preaching. If I'm not mistaken, he ended up losing both legs. And he ended up pastoring a St. Paul Holiness Church in Jacksonville, Georgia, just north of the Broxton Campground. He was still singing up until the day he died. Hey, the fire might have flamed, might have flickered, but the fire has never gone out. Some years ago when Brother Neil Bridges passed away with pneumonia, and the RN there declared him dead, said he's been dead, he's sick, he's had pneumonia, he's dead. Uh, uh, Brother Neil Bridges came back from the dead. God healed him and he's still preaching. Uh, I saw him when he had tubes in his nose and an oxygen tank uh, on his shoulder that he toted around. But he's no longer toting that around. He said when he died, uh, he walked through the portals of glory. And there standing on two good legs uh, was Leon Buster. He said, sweet of God, what are you doing here, Neil? Uh, and suddenly a voice said, Neil, I'm not done with you yet, Go back to earth and preach my gospel and tell them of the great things you have seen. Brother Leon Buzzard had two brand new legs. Sister Cheryl and I'll tell you something else he was singing. Is the fire has never gone out. I tell somebody the flame has flickered but the fire has not gone out. Let's stand right here. Raise our hands and worship and praise the Lord. This is more than a campfire. We're going to fan it right here. We're going to fuel it right here. Come on, I can see it right now go from a flicker to a blazing inferno. If whoever it is God is telling to get out of your pew and the fan the flame. I tell you to go from a flicker to a blazing inferno. One brother told me recently, he said I was driving down the road and the Holy Ghost shook me. He got a hold of me. What would happen tonight right here in this church house if we fanned the flames? Remembering the faithfulness. Removing the fear. And rekindling the flame. Let's raise our hands, worship, and praise God. You can't see Paul. He's in a Roman prison. Timothy, you can't put your eyes on man. You can't put your eyes on your pastor at this time. You can't put your eyes on that elder. You've got to put your eyes on Jesus. I said you've got to put your eyes on Jesus. Timothy, stir it up. Timothy, shake it up. Stir it up. Does anybody feel the dampness that the devil is bringing into this world? Does anybody feel the coldness? Does anybody feel it? Just rock us to sleep. Somebody build a fire. Somebody obey God right now. 
Let's just all throw our hands up towards heaven and worship and praise God. Say, God, I want to pray effectually. I want to pray fervently. There's much that needs to be accomplished. It depends on me stirring it up. Stirring it up. Stirring it up. You know what Timothy had to do at that point? He folded up the letter and he said, I hear you, Paul. Paul couldn't hear his response. Paul couldn't watch his response. He had to act alone. That's why this service here tonight, the Holy Ghost has been waiting on about four of you. I have felt it while I preached. He's waiting on about four of you to do what God wants you to do. Samuel, you're fast asleep. Eli, you're fast asleep. The lamp of God is about to go out. What are you going to do? I think I'll throw it in my hands. I think I'll start praising the Lord. I think I'll feed it. I think I'll fuel it. I think I'll fan it. Stir up the gift. It's a gift. Stir up the gift. I know of two of you right now that's come to mind. I know of four that God has put on my heart while I preach. I know of two right now at this moment. If you want to make God hear him for you. Jesus. Jesus. Brother Rocap, go pray for Brother Fred, would you please? Amen. Timothy, neglect not the gift. Timothy, I'm writing another book to you, another letter. Stir it up. Neglect it not. Stir it up. I know what somebody needs to do right now. We all need to treat every service just like it's our last. We all need to treat every service just like it's our brother and sister's last. We all need to treat it like it's the most special time of the day. It is the most special time of the day. If I knew in 10 minutes I'm going to stand before God, how would I worship Him right now? If I knew I'm going to stand before Him in 15 minutes, what kind of sacrifice would I take? It would be a burnt sacrifice. I would take care of a warm on fire sacrifice. Discouragement can't take a toll on you if you'll fan the fire. Stir it up. Stir it up. This is more than a campfire. You gotta take it from a flicker to a blazing inferno. Why am I feeling this way? Why am I thinking this way? You better stir it up. The lamps of God were in the tabernacle. They were to burn continually. You got to praise Him continually. You got to lift up the name of Jesus continually. Hallelujah. Yes, there's been some hardship circumstances in all of our lives. But God is worthy of our praise continually. Hallelujah. I feel liberty. Somebody's obeying God. Are you obeying God? Are you waiting on somebody else? One day you won't have Apostle Paul. The only thing you'll be holding is a letter in your hand, a sermon, a CD, a Paul saying, stir it up. One day you won't have Pastor Howell. You'll go get that CD and you'll play it. You'll listen. Remember, Pastor said, stir it up. Let's do it while we got Paul with us, Timothy. Let's do it while we got our church family. Let's do it before we're in prison. Stir it up. Hallelujah. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Brother Leon Bozak would say, stir it up. Stir it up. Stir it up. It may be flickered, but it ain't going out. Come on, the sour's in the house now. If you just obey God, everybody else is obeying God. You go ahead and do it. Stir it up. Hallelujah. Rekindle that fire. You need some Holy Ghost kindling right now. Hey, Holy Ghost, breathe on us. Holy Ghost, breathe on us. Breathe on us, Holy Ghost. Hallelujah. You can't afford to be, Lord. You can't afford to be now 
God. You can't afford to shut down, praise God. Tell you what the Holy Ghost wants right now. Sister Howell, go pray with Sister Roadcap. Sister Roadcap's doing good. She's on fire. But that's what the Holy Ghost wants right now. Praise God. Maybe God's told you to pray for somebody right now. Hallelujah. Stir it up, brother. Samuel, pray for Brother Jeremiah. Rekindle the fire. Rekindle the fire. When I feel that warmth inside, I know my Lord is satisfied. The flame has flickered, but the fire has never gone out. The flame has flickered, but the fire has never gone out. People have handed us nothing but a shovel full of ashes of what used to be a powerful church in our independent movement. We can't sit there and stare at a shovel full of ashes. We've got to go to the source and find the flame. We've got to rekindle the fire. We can't live on what used to be. These back in spines, preachers won't preach on time holiness. We've got to preach it. If these people won't worship God in spirit and in truth, we've got to worship Him in spirit and in truth. We've got to get a hold of it. We can't live it. We've got to stir it up. We can't live it. Come on, the liberty of the Holy Ghost is present. I can't lay here and freeze to death. I can't lay here and freeze to death. Somebody better fall out. You better stir it up and you'll freeze to Somebody hurt you, somebody in church calls you to be wounded. You can't lay at home and be hurt. You can't wallow in grief and doubt, worry, and fear, and anxiety. You got to get back to the fire. You got to get back to the warmth of the Holy Ghost. Come on, saints of God. You're going to have to get this for yourself. Oh, where are your priorities, Steve? Are the high priest that let the spiritual light dim? The lamp of God was going out. In other words, because of him personally and others, the church was suffering. His priorities were wrong. We've got to take care of ourselves before we can take care of others. We got to take care of ourselves spiritually. His priorities were wrong. Let's all just find a place to kneel and pray. Those of you that are standing and worshiping and praising God, please continue to pray. If you're standing and worshiping and praising God, please continue to pray. But if your mind is wandering and you're just looking around, I want you to spend some time because I feel like you're going to backslide. That's what I felt like God told me today. There's going to be a great, great spiritual blizzard coming. The end of Christ is upon us. And if you don't learn to get this for yourself, you're going to fall away. That's what the Holy Ghost told me today. Your priorities need to be right. 